In the heart of Ghana, along the coasts of the Atlantic Ocean, stands a monument to one of the most tragic captures in human history. The Cape Coast Castle is not just a relic of the past, it's a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and a reminder of the atrocities of the slave trade. Today we delve into the histories of this fortress and the role it played in the transatlantic slave trade, which is a story of sorrow, endurance, and hope. Hello, I'm Dr. Kaiwan Brown and welcome to this episode of More Than Medicine. We're here at the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, a place where history speaks from the walls and tells us a story that we must never forget. Join me as we explore the history of this significant site, understanding not just its past, but its importance on the present and the lessons of the future. So we're here at the Cape Coast Slave Castle which is one of many um, ports of which slaves were taken from the motherland to the Americas and or the Caribbean. We're about to start a tour of this facility, but just being here just has a weight on your spirit where you just feel the magnitude um, of, of what transpired here decades and decades ago. It's truly a place that humbles you, infuriates you, but also as a diasporant coming back to Africa, I feel like, you know, at the end we've won. We've won. Despite it all, we still persevered. Despite it all, we still have resilience. Despite it all, we still reproduced, procreated and evolved as, as, as a people, but not negating the sacrifice of the ancestors. Cape Coast Castle, originally built by the Swedish in the 17th century, was one of the largest slave holding sites in the West Africa. It changed hands among the European powers, including that of the Danish, the Dutch, and finally the British, becoming a central hub in the transatlantic slave trade. It's taking us about one hour, so we are walking. And I'll begin the tour first with a brief introduction. Now, this is historic Cape Coast Castle. But the word Cape Coast itself, it is a corrupted Portuguese word from the word Cabo Cos, which means short kick and that was corrupted into kick post by the English people. And this structure is the youngest and the last slave castle in Ghana. Yes, I'll in Ghana them. we have three major castles and several of the forts along the coast that were built by Europeans. But the first one is at Elmina that was built around 1482 by Portugal. We have one in Accra, the Danish one. That was built by the Danes around 1661. This one was started by the British in 1665. If you look at the ages, this is the youngest. This one was built at the time trans atlantic slave trade started in Africa for 200 years already. The way British designed this particular castle, the dungeons, they kept 1,000 300 slaves in the dungeon at a given time. Men were underground in 1,000. Women were there 300. They stayed two weeks in the dungeons to about three months, all because of availability of British ships. But 1807, British came out with a law that said stop slave trade. 1814, that was really the same thing. But from that time to 1860, Africa slave trade did not stop. That alone continued for about 40 years. So 1860, slavery ended. So they used this building again as a colonial administrative center. Not only Ghana, British colonial for this building, but other English colonies in West Africa, like Nigeria, Sierra Leone, this structure served as their headquarters. The British were here up to the time Ghana regained independence on the March 6th, 1957. Then we moved the British out of the castle. So the castle, as of 2023, it is 358 years old. 
that Mina the first is about 541 years old. When we went to the museum, we read everything towards the end, especially. You see that before British started the construction in 1665, this land changed hands from Portuguese through Swedish, through Danish, through Dutch into the British people. So when the British defeated the Dutch in 1664 and they were trading, they knew other Europeans were attacked, so they got this one for the French. So let me explain that one a little bit. Portuguese occupied the land first. That was the time they built the Almina Castle. 1637, when Dutch conquered them at Almina, they abandoned this land as well. But in 1654, Swedish also came in from Europe. They built a structure in the courtyard. They called that one Fort Kalilism. They were trading in gold and ivory. When they had enough, they left. Then later, the Danish came. What the Danes were at the point in time, the local people called the fate to be the indigenous since the fort. With time, they gave it to the Danes again. So when the Danes were in Dutch, were attacked. When the Danes were defeated, the Danes went to build the one in Accra, Usu Castle. So why Dutch thought they finished everybody? 1664, British attacked them. In 1664, was the same year, a state in North America called New York, then New Amsterdam, changed her from Dutch to British. The same year, British defeated the Dutch over here. So when the British defeated the Dutch, they were here. They brought these weapons for defense. So all other Europeans who came after the English couldn't conquer them because of the weapons. They built the entire spot and city great lines. They got this place from England. They brought them to balance their empty ships to Africa. When we were going, these African people as balance away. There was no cement in those days. They built this whole structure using branded sea shells mixed with lime powder and then palm oil. And the foundation is a natural rock. They built it on a huge rock. That's why for years they built it strong. So it is a small introduction. But this place was designed for some of the black people that British kept in the dungeons as slaves or captives. And I told you they would go to toilet, they would urinate, and they were in there for three months. The place was smelling, stingy. So some of them were fighting the white men because they were suffering. Their message was freedom, freedom. Those doing that, men like us, they brought them here. Take note, the cell has three doors. My brother, just watch. What's the door here? First one. They will lock the first one. They will lock the second one. They will, tell. they will lock the three doors. They won't give them food, no drop of water, no air, no light till they kill them. So this was a condemned cell then for Africans fighting for their freedom. And from then, any African leader, if you notice what is happening, any African leader who tried to fight and liberate African people, what did they do to him? Kill them. They killed them. So this was where they killed freedom fighters. But today we are not dying, we are going out. But please, as I said, bend low. Please do that for me. You see posts like this in the dungeons, it means windows that are Windows. But the bigger one here serves as a spiral. Spiral. But on top of where we are standing now, British went to build a church. They said they were Christians. They go to church. They call the church a society for the propagation of the gospel, SPG. That changed into Anglican church. The so British were up preaching Bible. Africans were here suffering from it. They didn't see anything wrong with that. Let's come. We are entering one of the few that you
said he discovered the Americas. Mm -hmm. When he said so, the Spanish moved from Europe to those places and they established their plantations where they needed labor to work. So they tried to use the local people. They called the Native Americans and the Red Indians to work for them. But according to the same Europeans, they said those people were not strong and they were dying from diseases. So there was a Roman Catholic bishop. His name was Bartolomeo de las Casas. He suggested to the Spanish people to look for alternative source of labor to replace the Native Americans. But that meant to look for black people who are stronger and can work in a similar climatic condition to replace the Native Americans. So then the demand for the Africans started coming. They came for us to go and work for them on their farms in America and Caribbean. So if you talk of weeding and harvesting sugarcane, cutting, tobacco, rice, and working in the construction sectors, and the mines could have been men like us, but they took women like you. And the question is why? Why? Because they were taken to go and give birth so that they get more out of them. Mm. So when the women got to the new world, basically they forced them to multiply in their millions. Some of them were even turned into baby making machines. Mm. In these dungeons, they treated them like the men, and they worked for them 400 years. They didn't pay them anything. Here they, they were treated like the men, they would go to toilets, they would urinate. At the end of agreement, women passed their menstruations in addition, naturally. They didn't bath, they didn't clean their teeth for three months. And upon all this treatment given to them, they still raped African women. So anytime they wanted to rape, they leave upstairs and take it there. They'll come down, open this or that, they'll look through, and they'll select a woman to their bedroom to go and rape. Those who said no to that were punished in that cell. Some got pregnant. So when they were ready to go, women who got pregnant were freed. They built houses for that around Cape Coast town with bricks like this. They kept them there. They, they became free people. They gave them all they needed. When they gave birth, sometimes they'll free their mother with a child. But they'll take care of their mother and the baby after about 10 years or more. And they'll take, go and take the light skin away from the mother. They'll bring their mother again as a slave. Oh. <coughs> and they gave birth to mulattoes. And they were proud giving names to those children. Mm -hmm. That is how come along the coast of Ghana. My brother was discussing that with me. Along the coast of Ghana, where the whites settled, there are light skinned people. And some of, some of the Ghanaians with European last names. We have names, we have, we still have names in Ghana like Van Dyke, Van der Poy, Van Dyke, Da Costa, De Souza, Johnson, Coombson, Ferguson, Morrison, Davison, Williams, Texan, Brown, Bruce, Rudolph, Coca, Anderson, Davis, Wood, Chinri, Hesse, uh, all of this, this something, Williams, a lot of them, Van der Man, plenty of them. I don't know all. Mm. These are names for the white people. Mm. Before the white men came to rape African women, mm. give birth to mulattoes and giving names. We never had these names. Mm. They were typical African tribal names, like Okai Quake, typical Akan names, Gan, the Dangwe names, Ewe names. That is invention. You know, this person is a Gan, it's an Ewe, it's an Ashanti, it's a Yoruba. Mm. So if you are Ghanaian, you are here. You know, some of these Thompsons, Williams. Chim rehearses, the wood, Branson, Dixon, Taylor, Joseph, please, if you see them, educate them from your kid. <laughs> Before they came, we never had these names. Mm, yes. Why my sister is laughing like that? You know some of them? We are wood. You are wood. Oh. <laughs> what type of wood? <laughs> yeah, they say we are from here. Well, yes, these names are all over the coast, but these are not African names. They are not. They came from Europe. In fact, I don't know. It is sad. They are light skin, because they were mixed race, mixed blood, white half, white half white half blacks. That's how these names came about. And let me tell you, even in that. Continue through colonial time.
colonial time. It is a part of history. When the country, they were still running the country for over 100 years. They gave birth to the mulattoes, and the mulatto children were favored in government in positions. That's why if you look at the academic ladder and then the judges and all these big, big people now, they are the top because their ancestors were ruling. So they gave them position, they gave them the opportunity. When they come the Judge Nabu, the Chief Hesses, the uh, Panamans, the Dixie, all of them, the Nimoy Thompsons, a lot. And the Planche. The Planche, a lot. I don't know, but plenty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go. And if you look at this floor, you cannot see bricks here. So what does this one mean? What is this one? This is the waste. This is all solidified waste. Mm. The original floor is made of bent bricks, like the other side. Some of the bricks I've been showing you, so as you can see. Mm -hmm. Yes. So out of the thousand black people, by the time British were ready to go with them, some of them died because of the treatment given to them. But those who survived, that was not the end of their journey. They bring them from the dying trees. Always they chained them. They were not free like us. When they reached here, there was this. There was a hole at the back of this white cloth. They called it a tunnel. So they forced them through the tunnel. They take them to the door of no return, where we will go later. But the tunnel was blocked when the crane was over. That was done to signify the end of this trade. But when we go outside briefly, I will show you part of the hole. But here the hole is blocked up with day. When they bring them from the darkness to where we are gathered now. They got to stay here for over a month. Some of them were sick and weak. When they got to the sick ones, British should select them. They will send them to that small room to go and wait temporarily. Just to allow those who were strong to go. Because nobody wants to go with a sick person. That was why they created this window. Because then there wasn't light. So this was created for them to see who was sick. It was not sick. They call where we are standing now selection room or sorting room. This one is a shrine, which wasn't here. But the shrine was around this part of the land before British came. It's for the local people. When the British came, they built the castle. They stopped the local from coming closer to pray. The local people came for the shrine to their community. So when the British left, they brought it back here. This was brought in 1960. The name is Nana Tabil. In Cape Coast, there are 77 of these girls. Nana is one. You can see some flowers around here. This doesn't mean that somebody died. The blacks taken away. The actual people did not get the chance to come back alive. But the descendants are coming home globally today, like you are here this morning. Whenever they come, we go around on a tour like this. Frankly speaking, many, many of them share tears with us. So that some pray, they pour a they do other rituals, they live this is here, and they go back. That's why this is here. So today, we will not be going to the sick bay. We'll go through the tunnel to the dock and return. We are free. You can take your pictures after that. we we'll go outside. Continue with the tour. They worked with some black people to get other black people. Because today, before they would get you and destroy you, they will use your own people to do that. Like what is happening globally today. Some Africans call slave raiders, like armed robbers of today. Do you know armed robbers? <laughs> there are some people like that in society. When Europeans came, they identified them. So they gave them guns, whiskey, sugar, sardine, mirrors. And their system of trading was butter. So the robbers accept European goods. They organize themselves like we are gathered now. They go to villages, go and raid, capture people, bring them to the white, and they change what they gave them. Some of the Africans were told that they were taking them to abroad for good living. They gave themselves up. But the last one that brought majority was ethnic conflict, intertribal wars. And we, we must know from today, as black people, that before the white men came to Africa in 1471, there was nothing like Ghana, or Nigeria, or Gambia, or Togo, or Senegal, or South Africa. Then we had kingdoms. There were empires, African states. So we were ruled by kings and queens. And there was law and order. But no matter the kings and queens who fight each other over a boundary just to expand their territory. Sometimes they fight over land they perceive to be rich of gold or any natural resource. And before Europeans came, the kings and queens would fight each other with bows and arrows that they made locally. When they go to war with these locally manufactured weapons, after a long fight, one tribe will lose the war. The losers will be taken as domestic slaves. It was more like indentured servitude. Those people, they had some amount of freedom. They could marry 
raised free children. They could acquire property. Later, they were integrated into the family system. They were not kept in buildings like those ones. They were also not transported to Europe and Americas permanently. They were free people in society. And I believe that system of slavery has been with human from time immemorial. In ancient Rome, Egypt, even in the Bible. Let me give an example. In Ghana, I can tell you on authority that not long ago, if you own somebody, he hasn't got that amount of money to pay. You can allow your son, your daughter, sometimes your wife, to go and serve or work for the one you owe for a number of years. He has to pay the debt. Do you remember? Yes. Thank you. So the period of work, they will call you a slave. It could be one year, five or ten years. If you are working like that and you are a woman and you are beautiful with a good character, and somebody from the master's family should get married to you, automatically you free yourself from the slave to be part of the family. But there's no way I can enslave my wife. I don't think you brothers can do same. Even there was a system whereby if you, you are working as a slave at that time and you are a guy and you are hard working and loyal to your master, the master can entrust his property into your head. So in case the master is dead, you rise from nowhere to be the head of the family. So from zero to hero. So before the white men came, Africa, we had this system across the kingdoms and tribes. And when they came, the situation changed. Quickly, they capitalized on the system we had. So they brought guns to the chiefs who were leaders. Then, and the guns were brought to replace the then bows and arrows. And we know the power of the gun. They added a sardine, mirror, tobacco. They gave it to the African chiefs. And they went to pay. But the system was better. And they convinced the chiefs that they need the guns to protect themselves. Use the guns to fight the other people, take everything. The guns get to the chiefs. They organize their people, use their weapons against the other tribes. So there were conflicts among the Africans, left, right, center. So the more they go to the war, the end result was to get people like us as prisoners of war in exchange for European use. This was the system 500 years ago. If you look at what is happening globally in the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen, let's be frank for today. Has something really changed at all? Mm -hmm. The mask wore right there. <laughs> it is a part of history. You can see where the shrine is. We were down there a few minutes ago. That is why I told you there will be selection when we are ready to go with the captives. And from there, when they select them, the stronger ones were not allowed to come outside. From there, they go through a passage. So there's a big hole through here to the down here to the double return. These ones are cannons for British to attack other Europeans. These ones are bullets. So these ones are cannonballs. These ones are cannons. This is the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Guinea. So I'll give you about a minute for pictures for the sake of those who didn't come in when we're starting. One minute, then we can resume. When for the volume is about 20,000 gallons. They do only rain harvesting. We have some pipes around the building. Whenever it's rain, they harvest the water and store it here. So this is rain harvester. Hmm. This was the auction block. I told you just now how they got the black people. And I said they would walk from the point of capture through Brother Hassel, through Kumasi, when they got to Asima, the other stop over. When they were made to bar for the last time on their own. Kumasi was to the right. Kumasi to this place about at most two days' walk, sometimes a day walk. When they arrived from Asima, they would bring them here. This was where they do auctioning. Or it was the auction block. Yeah, it's We are in front of the door of the return. But the door was here, but it was very small and narrow. Which was designed for one human being at a time. So this is not the original. It is not this. The original was small. It was designed for one person in a way it was to control them as one. Well. But this one came during colonial time. You know, after European taking human resource. For 400 years. They colonized Ghana for 113 years. 
then they took raw materials out of this country to go and develop England. So the dough was too small for them of raw materials to go through. So they made it bigger like this. So this came colonial time. And if you go through this door of no return, during the time of slave trade, as a black person, one, you will lose your identity. You will lose your culture, respect, dignity, and everything. From here, some of the captives were taken to North America, United States, places like Jamestown in Virginia, North and South Carolina, and all the regional British states in America. There were 13 states. They all passed away, the regional states. Some went to England, Liverpool, and Liverpool was the biggest slave harbor in the whole of Europe. And that's also ended up in Bristol, Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, including Barbados. But those who went to Brazil, they were taken from Albina Castle, because Brazil was a Portuguese colony. Some of the Brazilians were taken from Angola, East Africa. But Suriname, Dutch, Guyana, Curaçao, they were taken from Albina Castle by the Dutch. Those who went to the French Caribbean, they were taken from Senegal, Gori Island. And those who went to Haiti, most of them were taken from Benin. And interestingly, Brazil received the largest number of slaves from Africa. Brazil got 47% of the entire slaves from Africa. And Brazil is the third largest black population in the whole world, outside Nigeria and Ethiopia. Did you know that? That is a fact. As we speak today, Brazil have a black population of about 93 million. It is not a joke. So all those black we see play soccer in Europe, and they call themselves Brazilians. They are not Brazilians, they are Africans. Because Brazil is not an extension of Africa. They are there because of slave trade. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. African, at least once in our lifetime, we should come to Ghana for that matter, keep those dangers and go to the door of return. That is exactly what we have done today, three years after the year of return. So I am so, so proud of you for returning. So we are returning, but the tour is not over yet. We are only returning. Let's go. <coughs> This castle was the last African home for millions of enslaved Africans before they were shipped to the Americas and to the Caribbean. The legacy of the Cape Coast Castle is not just one of pain and suffering, but is also of resilience and most importantly, survival. The descendants of those who have passed through these walls have contributed immensely to the culture and societies of the Americas and the Caribbean, in spite of the brutal legacy of slavery that sought to dehumanize them. The Cape Coast Castle teaches us invaluable lessons about our shared history, the depth of human cruelty, and the incredible strength of the human spirit to overcome. As we remember those who have suffered and those who have survived, let us commit to a future where such injustices never repeat themselves. Thank you for joining me on this journey to understand more than just medicine, but the very fabric of human society and resilience. Until next time, take care.